Would you turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 19, beginning at verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there, which no other has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Let's bow together. Oh, sovereign Lord, we bow before you now. We have read your word, your precious and true word. And we have learned that we are utterly dependent not only upon our own reading, but we are dependent upon the illuminating work of your spirit, giving light to the word, giving us understanding in our minds and hearts, giving us wills that desire to follow after you. Lord, we pray that you'd be with us in this assembly this morning. Thank you for each man, woman, and child that's here. We pray, Lord, that as their ears are tuned and turned to listen, we pray that each one will find, will hear in the scriptures, that which is necessary for their hearts today. We pray that we would glorify you. We pray that we would lift up and exalt the name of Jesus. We pray, Lord, that your spirit would be pleased to cause us to sit before you in wonder and awe as we see Jesus revealing himself, making known declaring in very uh, direct ways who he is, what he came to do. And yet these people missed it. Lord, don't let anyone here miss it. By your grace, by your spirit, show us your truth. And bring us all in humble submission before you to the praise and honor and glory of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. If you closed your Bibles, would you open them again to Luke chapter 19? 
What we just read, we all know as what? What do we call this event? I, I hear mumbling, but what? The triumphal entry. We all know this event as the triumphal entry, and today we celebrate what's commonly called Palm Sunday, right? Not, not these palms, but branches from palm trees. It has to do with this event. This is not a minor event in the life of our Lord Jesus. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all describe the entrance of Jesus to Jerusalem in some detail. It's not just something that, that happened and people happened to come out, crowds came out to accompany him. This was a deliberate and intentional act on the part of our Lord. He sent two of his disciples ahead to prepare the way in verses 30 and 31. He told them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you'll find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. Now, let, let me just ask you. I mean, we, we read these things, and sometimes we don't think it through. Put yourself in the position of those two disciples. You're going to a village. It's not your village. And you're to look for a colt. It's not your colt. And what are you to do? Untie that colt and take it. Now, in the West, we call that what? Stealing. Stealing. <laughs> we call it horse thievery, right? Or at least colt thievery. And we know that's a bad thing. And, and I'm sure that they must have had some sense of trepidation as they did it because even then, I mean, one of the basic commandments is thou shalt not steal. They know it's not their cult. They can't fake it. Oh, I'm sorry. We were, we, it looks just like ours. <laughs> no, no. They were given an answer. They, they were concerned. They asked, what should we say? They were given an answer. They were confronted by the owner. What are you doing? It's not kind of a disinterested, no, oh, what are you doing on tying the cold? No, it's confrontation. And they bring forth the answer that Jesus gave them. The Lord has need of him. Boom, that settles it. Okay. You know, that's all you needed. The, the Lord had prepared the way. He sent his disciples ahead. Verse 35 they brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. Uh, that, again, is a very deliberate, intentional, and significant act. The triumphal entry was a gateway to what some people call Holy Week or Passion Week, it was the gateway to all of the events that culminated in Jesus' arrest, crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection. Talk about a busy week. All of those things occurred within the space of a week. One week after his triumphal entry, Jesus rose from the dead, even as he said. Before going to Jerusalem, Jesus prepared his disciples for this tumultuous week. Luke chapter 18, verses 31 to 34, Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He's gearing them up to understand that what is about to take place is not accidental, not incidental, but intentional. In fact, promised by the prophets in the Old Testament. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, 
flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. On another occasion, Jesus began talking about these events. And Peter, the spokesman for the group, sometimes unadvisedly, but Peter actually opposed Jesus. Don't talk that way. Do you remember Jesus' response to him? In the King James, get the behind me Satan. Why did he say that? It was a temptation. In fact, it was one of the temptations in the wilderness that Satan told Jesus he could accomplish being the king of the nations without having to go through the cross. That if he worshiped Satan, Satan would give it to him. And Jesus' response was, no way. That's not what, the, not what the text says directly, but that was the essence of it. And that's his response to Peter. No way. You don't understand. This is going to happen. It has to happen. It has to happen just this way. And that's what he's telling his disciples here. Luke says the disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them, and they did not know what he was talking about. In Matthew chapter 20, the same thing. Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. On the way, he took the 12 aside and said to them, We are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified. On the third day, he will be raised to life. So that's Luke, that's Matthew, Mark, and John also have Jesus talking about his death on the way to Jerusalem. The message we get from that, this is significant. This is important. This was planned. This was necessary. John comments in chapter 12, verse 16, at first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been done to him, these things had been written about him, and that these things had been done <clears throat> to him. What should we learn from this event, this triumphal entry? Let me suggest several things. First is this. Consider <clears throat> the office and the majesty of our Lord Jesus Christ. Consider the office and the majesty of Christ. This is one of those prophecy-fulfilling self-disclosures by which Jesus reveals his identity to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. The specific prophecy in view here is Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. The prophet says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. It's hard, to, it's hard to, to read verses like that and not shout. I usually raise my volume at least a, a little bit because you're supposed to be excited, right? Rejoice greatly. It's not kind of rejoice greatly and 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 shout, and if you feel like shouting, shout. No, shout, daughter of Jerusalem, see your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. That will be accomplished. Not by the war horses, not by the chariots, not by the best weapons available to mankind at the time. 
that will be accomplished by this one who comes, the one who is righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey. His kingdom will bring peace, real peace, and his kingdom will extend from the river to the ends of the earth. In fact, Matthew states it very plainly in chapter 21, verses 4 and 5. Matthew says, this took place in order to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. It's not coincidental. It's purposeful. Say to the daughter of Zion, see, your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Uh, it's important for us to see that, that Jesus is not just going up to Jerusalem along with other people as a worshiper. Jesus is not just going to Jerusalem as a prophet. Frederick Morris, in his little commentary on Luke, says in every one of the Gospels, the descent from the Mount of Olives and the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem is recorded as if it were a critical point in the narrative. Clearly, it could not be so if the object of the evangelist had been to present him primarily as a teacher or a prophet. Was he a teacher? Yes, he was. Was he a prophet? Yes, he was. Was he only a teacher and a prophet? No. And that's the point of this riding on a colt into the city of Jerusalem. Jesus is making a public declaration. His entrance to the city in this manner has great significance to anyone familiar with the scriptures of the Old Testament. There is no mistaking that this is Jesus proclaiming that he is the long-awaited king sent by God to save his people from their sins and to establish the kingdom that will extend from the river to the ends of the earth and will never end. This is Jesus' own public, and I'm emphasizing that, this is Jesus' own public proclamation to the people, this is who I am. And the events that follow will not be done in the shadows, will not be done in darkness. I self-declare who I am. And all of the events that follow, I have ordained as necessary to the fulfillment of my mission. And it will be done for all men of all time and all places to see. It will be public. All the promises of God, all of the prophecies of God, all the hope of mankind rides on the back of a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Matthew 21, 9, the crowds that went ahead of him, those that followed, shouted, Hosanna! Luke doesn't mention that, but the other gospel writers do. Hosanna! Do you remember what that means? We use the word. We don't often translate it. The word is used in Psalm 118, verse 25, and in Psalm 118, it's a prayer. It's a pleading. Lord, save us. That's what the verse says. Lord, save us. It could also be translated, save us now. In this context, that plea 
is changed into an acclamation of praise to Jesus Christ. Lord, save us now. They cry out to the one who is riding on the back of the donkey to come in and accomplish the completion of that saving work. This is what God has ordained. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Mark also says, those who went ahead and those who followed. We have a picture of people moving ahead of Jesus, people following behind Jesus, a great parade accompanying him into the city. And they shout out, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Jesus comes as the king of glory and the savior of his people. And his people respond by rolling out a proverbial red carpet. It's not literally a red carpet, but it's a carpet made of what? Their garments, chapter 19, verse 36 of Luke, says, as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. They put their own clothes down beneath the feet of the Savior who is coming into his city. And the other gospel writers tell us that the people cut off branches. Their cloaks were not enough. They cut off branches from palm trees And they both wave them and they cast them down before the advancing Savior on the back of the colt. This is a parade. This is a ceremonial event. In the ancient world, it was common. And we do something of the same thing. If a dignitary was coming to the city, someone important, a king or or even a lesser noble person was coming to the city, Then a party would go out from the city to welcome him and accompany him in. We send advanced teams to get ready for a presidential visit, things like that. And then he is met and carried in or or he is accompanied into the venue where the president is to speak or whatever. This is what's happening. That's what the crowd is there, acknowledging Maybe not understanding, in fact, definitely not understanding the implications of what they're doing, but they're acknowledging the king is advancing into his city. The king is taking control. The king is bringing salvation. Clearly, they did not perceive how he would save them or how he would rule them but they rejoiced in him for all the miracles that he had done verses 37 and 38 when they came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. It's possible that they thought of salvation in terms of deliverance from bondage to Rome. It's possible that they thought of salvation and God's kingdom as a political entity, it's possible, having seen Jesus heal the sick, heal injuries and wounds, raise the dead, if you had a king like that, feed 5,000, if you had a king like that, you wouldn't have to worry about losses in battle. He'd raise them up. You wouldn't have to worry about logistics and getting food to the troops. He would provide food with a a word. He could speak it into being. It's possible that they thought in those terms. 
But that's not what Jesus came to do. His mission was even greater than they could imagine. Jesus came not to be the political savior of a national entity or even an ethnic people. Jesus came to be the savior of the world, the one and only savior of the world. So consider his office and majesty that we see him proclaiming here. Secondly, consider the gentleness and the humility of Christ. It's a striking and unusual sight, is it not? The king, the king of kings. That's a superlative, means he's the king over all the kings. Not just one of the kings, not just the top of the kings, but he is without duplication, without any rival, the king of kings, entering his capital city to cheering crowds mounted on a, a donkey? A donkey? That is kind of disarming. Um, when I was 12 or 13, we lived in Baltimore. My dad had an office in Washington, D.C., and I remember being in Washington, D.C., when a motorcade came down the street. I was on the sidewalk near the White House. And I watched the motorcade, the motorcycles and then the, the limousines with flags and all of that. And, and I actually saw President Kennedy in the back seat of the bulletproof limousine as it entered through the gates into the White House grounds. It was an impressive sight. But Imagine <clears throat> this impressive motorcade of police, motorcycles, limousines with important people in it, and then comes the presidential vehicle. It's an armored Kia. Mm -hmm. or, or maybe an armored uh, VW Bug, a, a green one with a spoiler and fluffy eyelashes. Right? My daughter has one of those. Can, can you imagine? Uh, would that be impressive? It, it would not seem to be fitting. It doesn't inspire awe. It's not impressive. It's a bit underwhelming. It's not overwhelming. But then stop and think. It is impressive. It impresses us in a way that is unexpected. It is fitting. For it befits the humility of God who became man in order to save men. Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11, this very familiar passage, your attitude, he says to the church, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross." Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Do you catch the scope of what he's saying there? This king is so mighty and so powerful, yet he comes in a very humble way. But Paul wants us to know that we should not be fooled by his humility 
into thinking he is insignificant. Every knee shall bow. Do you know what the Bible means by every? Every kind of knee and every knee. There is no person dead, living, or yet to come who will not at the end of time bow their knee in the presence of Jesus Christ. Some willingly, trustingly, believing in him for the salvation that is promised and others bowing the knee submissively as they stand, as they kneel before the judge of heaven and earth. Everybody we meet is going to have a relationship or does have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The question is, what is that relationship? Believer or unbeliever? Submissive or rebellious? Loving or hateful? But there is no one accepted. Every knee shall bow. This manner in which Jesus comes befits his gentleness. John takes some liberty with the text from Zechariah. In John 12, 15, John renders it, he kind of paraphrases it this way. Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. Do you remember what it said in Zechariah? I made reference to it. I told you it's hard to read this without lifting up your voice because it says, rejoice. It says, shout. John paraphrases it. The rejoice word, John says, means don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. We, we who believe in Jesus, we who know him, have no reason to be afraid of him. Now, that's a different thing from what the Bible calls the fear of God. The fear of God is very important in the scriptures. It's not a fear, however, for the believer. It's not a fear that causes us to, to run away and flee to the mountains and call the rocks to fall upon us. The fear of God is that which causes us to stand in awe before him, to reverence him for who he is. This king does not come to oppress. This king comes to save. This king who is a prophet let me back up. This king who is a prophet is also a priest. We call that his threefold office. Prophet, priest, and king. He's a priest who came to offer himself as a sacrifice for the sins of his people. He saves us by dying in our place, by taking upon himself the guilt that rightly belongs to us. He rules us by rising from the dead and living at the right hand of God, overseeing the events on earth from his place in heaven. His power is not brutality, He is fearsome. He is, after all, omnipotent. He possesses all power. He himself told his disciples, all power, all authority. The word he uses there expresses both the right to rule and the power to enforce that right. All power and authority belong to him in heaven and on earth. There is no one who can challenge him. There is no one who can defeat him. There is no one who in any way can hinder him or thwart his will. But his power is not in brutality. It's not in that force. 
His power is His love. His power is His love. Paul says in Romans that it's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. Oh, we need to remember that, don't we? It, it, it is awfully tempting sometimes to browbeat people for their wickedness. But Romans, Paul says, it's the kindness of God. That's what we need to set before men. Yes, they need to know his justice. Yes, they need to know about heaven and hell. Yes, they need to know that they'll be held accountable for all their deeds and all of their speech and their thoughts. But it's the kindness of God. It's his love that leads us to repentance. J.C. Ryle comments in this way. <clears throat> he says, he knew that the time had come when he was to die for sinners on the cross. His work as the great prophet, as far as his earthly ministry was concerned, was almost finished and completed. His work as a sacrifice for sin and substitute for sinners remained to be accomplished. Before giving himself up as a sacrifice, he desired to draw the attention of the whole Jewish nation to himself. The Lamb of God was about to be slain. The great sin offering was about to be killed. It was meet or it was right that the eyes of all Israel should be fixed upon him. This great thing was not to be done in a corner. Uh, consider the office and the majesty of our king. Uh, consider his, his gentleness and his humility in completing his mission. <coughs> Finally this morning, consider the deceitfulness of unbelief in us. Consider the deceitfulness of unbelief in us. In Hebrews chapter 3, verses 12 and 13, the Scripture says, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Sin is deceptive and misleading. Its claims are untrue. Despite the, the clarity of Jesus' self-revelation, the crowd never really got it. In Matthew chapter 21, verses 10 and 11, Matthew tells us that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Was that answer true? Yeah, it was true. Jesus was the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. But was that answer complete? No. Was that answer even adequate? No. What does Jesus' name mean? You shall call his name Jesus for he what? He'll save his people from their sins. This event proclaimed in a very physical way, I'm here. I've come to do what my father promised, what all of the prophets promised. It's being fulfilled in your sight it's being fulfilled within the sound that you can hear. It's being fulfilled in your very presence. 
but they didn't get it. They rejoiced. They were excited about Jesus. These were the crowds that accompanied him in, throwing down their cloaks, throwing down their palm branches, proclaiming him the prophet, a great prophet, the miracle worker. But what they got fell short of what it was. And unfortunately, there are many, many people today who have that same perspective. They will honor Jesus as a prophet, a prophet. They will honor Jesus as a teacher. They will call Jesus a philosopher, a lover of wisdom. They will call Jesus a great moralist. and yet reject him as king and will not receive him as their savior. Do you remember what Jesus said in John 14, 6? And it's, if you could only, if you could, our English versions don't always give it justice. Jesus said, I am the way, the rest the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Uh, A couple things to point out. A good editor today would take that first sentence and say, we don't need the duplication of the definite article, that word the. It's useless to say it three times. We could just say, Jesus said, I am the way, truth, and life. No. The, the threefold use of the definite article is for emphasis. Jesus as the, is the way. There's no other way. Jesus is the truth. There's no other truth. Jesus is the life. There's no other source of life known to mankind. On the basis of that threefold definite article, Jesus then concludes no one comes to the Father except through me. Again, catch the scope of that. No one comes to the Father except through me. Our Old Testament friends, How do they come to the Father? They came to the Father by believing the promise about the Christ. They looked forward to His coming, but they trusted that He would come. They were saved by grace through faith, just as you and I are. But they were saved by looking to the Savior who would come, and we are saved by looking to the Savior who has come. But it's one and the same Savior. It's one and the same Jesus Christ. They're not two ways of salvation. My my friends, I, I have friends who believe that Jews were saved by keeping the law. If that's true, they were a whole lot better people than we are. Morally. They weren't. And the Psalms and other places make that so very clear. They are dependent upon the loving kindness of God. There are many churches today that will not proclaim that truth. Uh, yesterday morning, we had a, a fire fraternal, a Zoom fraternal. We have fire pastors from Oregon and Washington and Idaho and British Columbia who at the, on the last Saturday of every month meet by phone on, or by computer on Zoom. And one of the brethren in Canada recently studied the churches in his area. Within a 10-mile radius of his church, he said there are 65 churches in Kelowna, B.C. 65 churches within a 10-mile radius. He says of those churches, he only found six 
that believed the Bible is the inerrant word of the living God. What do the rest believe? Uh, they don't believe the Bible is the word of God. And the sticking point undoubtedly is Jesus' statement. This, this is the offense of the gospel. I, I don't know if you've, you know, we talk about the offense of the gospel. John 14, 6 is the offense of the gospel. Where Jesus says he is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes except through the Father. If we simply took that verse out or amended it, our message would be palatable to everybody. Nobody would argue with us except somebody who fell down over here. <laughs> Nobody would take exception. But that's a vast majority of churches that don't believe what the Scripture says. Uh, they're willing. They, they, they say they're Christian. It's on their, their name. It's on the front of their building or out on a sign. They say they're Christian. They believe they're Christian. They think they honor Christ when they call him a prophet, when they call him a teacher. But they don't know him as he reveals himself even here to be. It was interestingly the religious leaders who responded. Verse 39, some of the Pharisees in the crowd. Pharisees. Who were the Pharisees? Do you remember? We had, uh, we had several groups, groupings among the Jews. It's not exclusive to Christians. We, we have, you know, reform types, and we have other type liberals, and we have charismatics. They had similar things in their day. Uh, the the, uh, the Sadducees represented the liberal wing, as it were, of Judaism. They didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead. Um, the Essenes, uh, out in the, the people that tucked away the Dead Sea Scrolls and things like that, they were kind of the mystics. And uh, so they were kind of the charismatic wing of the old Judaism. And the Pharisees, <clears throat> Calvin says that the word Pharisee comes from a root for us which means to interpret. And the Pharisees saw themselves as Scripture-bound. They saw themselves as the rightful defenders and interpreters of the Scripture. And yet, they were the ones who missed this. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They kind of caught on to what he's saying. He's claiming to be the messianic promised Savior. And they tell him, stop it. Tell your disciples to shut up. And I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The very creation itself acknowledges Jesus Christ as king and savior. But the religious leaders missed it altogether. In less than a week, the crowds that joyfully shouted, Hosanna, changed their tune to crucify him. They were joined by others who came to the city for the Passover, larger crowds, but the tune was changed. How fickle, Ryle notes, are crowds, mob rule, how quickly they can be turned. From Hosanna, rejoicing, laying down palm branches, laying down clothes to create a red carpet, joyfully bringing him into the city. And now the cry is crucify him crucify him. They rejected Jesus. They saw but did not respect his majesty. They saw but did not appreciate or value his kindness. They wished he had never come, and they sought to remove him from the earth. 
That's still how the crowds, the majority of people, even religious people, treat him. I saw a banner at some demonstration or other and said this, if Mary had had an abortion, we wouldn't be in this mess. Can you imagine saying that about the Savior of mankind? Jesus is to blame. Crucify him. We're blinded by sin. In verses 41 and following, we read that as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Verse 43 seems to describe the pending destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Jesus says, the days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. But you, you know who Jesus is. You know why he came. You know what he did. Do you recognize the time of God's coming to you? Is not America a nation that God has cared for as much as Israel or Judah? Is not Seattle a city to be wept over as much as Jerusalem? Really, were their sins worse than ours? Are we as a people, not necessarily you specifically, but are, are we not just as deaf and blind and spiritually dead as they? J.C. Ryle says we know but little of true Christianity if we do not feel a deep concern about the souls of unconverted people. My friends, check your own heart. Have you turned from your sins to embrace the true and living God? Have you received forgiveness and cleansing through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ? Have you cast yourself wholly upon him? Do you trust Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Not what Christ did plus what you do. Do you trust him wholly and exclusively for your salvation? Then speak. Speak to others. Speak to family members. They may not appreciate it. Speak to friends, neighbors. Speak to co-workers. Speak to whoever will listen. And even if they don't listen, remember that every knee will bow. Call them to repent. Call them to believe. Show them who Jesus Christ is and what he has done. Let's bow together. Our Lord, we do give praise to you and thankfulness for the kindness that you've shown to us. It is overwhelming to us that you would come and offer your life as a sacrifice for sins, for our sins, for any one of us, for all of us. Lord, we rest in you. We know that we have nothing we can offer. We love you. We serve you not in a forced servitude, but we serve you because we know that you love us, and in response, we love you. 
and we desire to do those things that are pleasing to you. Use us, we pray, in our families to encourage one another. Use us as husbands and wives and mothers and fathers and children toward parents. Help us to, to lift up each other in prayer. Help us to lift up each other when we sense that there is discouragement or despair. Help us to stir up one another to love and good works and to do the things that glorify your name. Use us in drawing sinners to yourself for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.